Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Larry Cretion. I'm the executive director of the Green Energy Consumers Alliance, a nonprofit based in uh, Providence in Boston. Um, welcome to our virtual spring meeting. Um, ordinarily, we would have this kind of an event in Providence. Um, we were planning on having it at the beautiful uh, Botanical Center in Roger Williams Park, um, but we're unfortunately having to adapt to the COVID situation. Um, so I'm going to ask that you use your imagination and try to envision um, a beautiful place with wonderful flowers and plants. Uh, fortunately, two of our speakers have tulips in the background, so you'll be able to appreciate uh, that. Um, also, because it's noontime, um, ordinarily we would offer well, uh, hors d'oeuvres uh, and, and have some refreshments, So, uh, but feel free to get up and move around and go to the fridge if you're getting hungry. Um, you'll have to imagine um, the sort of hors d'oeuvres we would normally uh, supply to you. And if you hear a dog barking, I, um, that's not your imagination, that would be my dog. Um, so uh, in a minute, I will turn it over to Priscilla De La Cruz, um, who's our Rhode Island director, and she'll bring you up to date on uh, a very exciting concept that we're working on with several cities and towns in, in Rhode Island. Uh, it's based upon a model that we we pioneered in Massachusetts. It's called green municipal aggregation uh, or community choice aggregation. It goes by different terms. And it's all about bringing to uh, communities more renewable energy uh, than required by state law. Um, and after Priscilla uh, brings you up to date on that, our um, policy coordinator, Kai Salem, is going to facilitate a panel discussion with um, uh, some very important people uh, in the in the Rhode Island energy scene. Uh, State Senator Don Oyer uh, will uh, talk about legislative uh, possibilities. Uh, Commissioner Marion Gold of the Rhode Island uh, Public Utilities Commission will talk about uh, the regulatory side. And then we have Commissioner Nick Ucci uh, from the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources. Um, we, we try each year with our spring meetings to bring people like that together uh, to make this a wonderful opportunity for those of you who are concerned about the direction of uh, Rhode Island uh, energy uh, to hear it all in one place. And, and Kai will help you with that. When we get to that part of the uh, of the program, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions and uh, you'll see that on the right hand side of your of your uh, go to meeting bar. Um, there, there's no doubt about it that COVID is affecting uh, the way our organization and, and all of society is working. Um, our thing at our organization is to connect consumers to clean energy options. Uh, and, and that's made difficult because we like to get out and meet people uh, in public places. We like to have, take them on tours of wind facilities, um, solar projects, um, hydro projects. Um, and, you know, in the last couple of years, we've been offering people test drives on some really cool electric cars. Um, events like that are obviously on hold for a bit. And we look forward to maybe resuming those, uh, obviously, when it's safe to do so, when the science tells us we can do that. Um, but I'm very proud of the work that our staff have done um, for the last uh, couple of months, being as productive as they possibly can in a difficult time. Um, and so we're doing a lot of it, of course, virtually, um, and just like today. Um, they've been able to work uh, collaboratively together and, and with external folks and to serve our members. Um, for one thing, uh, we're writing a lot more blogs than ever before. If you go to our website, greenenergyconsumers.org backslash blog, you'll see how we're writing on a lot of topics, sometimes two or three a week about energy topics. And we're hosting a lot of webinars um, like this one on a variety of energy topics. And so we, if you go to our events section, um, you'll see that. Um, so on your screen right now is um, a list and also some great pictures of our uh, volunteer board of directors, which is the top picture. Uh, they put a lot of time in making sure that uh, we're fulfilling our mission and they do it on a volunteer basis and we appreciate uh, them. And then uh, the lower figure uh, photograph is uh, our wonderful staff um, who are really dedicated to the mission. Our mission is to uh, help consumers and society speed the transition to a low carbon future. Um, and so uh, I appreciate everything that they're doing. Uh, now's the time more than ever that we do what we do. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, we hope that you'll enjoy this. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions. And, and so for now, I just want to turn it over to our Rhode Island director, Priscilla De La Cruz. Uh, she's been with us for 10 years. Uh, time has flown. 
um, and she's doing a great job and she's leading our effort on community aggregation and she'll tell you more about that. So Priscilla. Thank you, Larry. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, definitely sad that we're not at the beautiful botanical garden as we originally planned, but we are thrilled that you are joining us online today as we all navigate this new normal. Um, so as Larry mentioned, I am Priscilla De La Cruz, our Rhode Island director. I have been working with our nonprofit now for about 10 years. Um, and in the recent years, I have been focusing a lot of my time in advancing green municipal aggregation, which is also known as community choice aggregation. Um, we describe municipal aggregation as the process by which a municipality can purchase electricity in bulk, and that is from a competitive supplier on behalf of its residents and small businesses. Um, to pursue benefits like cheaper or more stable electricity supply costs, gaining um, more control over its electricity and increasing um, consumer protection and transparency. While utilities like National Grid um, would continue to maintain wires and poles ensuring the delivery of physical electricity into our homes, we actually have the option to access cleaner energy supply um, while taking advantage of competitive rates that are, could bring um, consumer savings, and that is directly to each consumer. Um, our favorite flavor of uh, community choice aggregation is, of course, our very own program, Green Municipal Aggregation. Um, Green Municipal Aggregation um, is, a, it, it enables a community um, to tap into the benefits that we mentioned of stabilizing electricity supply, um, increasing consumer protection. Um, but um, what green municipal aggregation does is that it layers those benefits um, with the possibility of getting greener and cheaper, um, greener and cleaner electricity supply. So that is very exciting to us. We see it as a strong climate action tool where communities can um, take control over the local energy while procuring greener and cleaner electricity. Um, so through our work in the recent years, we're actually seeing an increasing number of communities in Massachusetts adding greener electricity to their aggregation programs. And that is above what the state law requires, either through a renewable energy standard or a renewable portfolio standard that requires a given utility like ours, National Grid, to provide a certain percentage of renewable energy. So now we're talking about giving communities the tool um, to procure um, more renewable energy in addition to what that law requires and bringing us ahead of state policy. So that brings on additional benefits resulting in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and like I mentioned, making it a very strong climate action tool that can provide both the economic benefits that we talked about, but also the environmental benefits. Um, so taking a look back at our recent history, back in 2017, um, green energy consumers successfully worked State Representative Deb Verduro from Jamestown to change the municipal aggregation law in order to actually make it easier for communities to take advantage of aggregation. So actually municipalities through the League of Cities and Towns for over a decade have been able to aggregate their electricity load um, for their munis municipal buildings. Um, but what we did back in 2017 and Deborah Rodero championed um, through the legislature was to actually um, be able to pass on that benefit to um, residents and small businesses within a given municipality. Um, so thanks to that effort and the continued outreach and advocacy work that our team has done, alongside um, other partners and allies. We're seeing Rhode Island communities actually move forward with aggregation in Rhode Island. Um, so to talk briefly about that progress, I would actually love to welcome Jamie Rhodes, who has been working with our partner, Good Energy, who worked with us a few years ago to develop green municipal aggregation. So Jamie, take it away. Thanks, Priscilla, um, and thanks everyone for joining today with uh, Green Energy Consumers Alliance. I'm excited to be here, and yeah, so just give a quick picture. Uh, once again, I work for Good Energy. Um, we are a consultant to uh, Rhode Island municipalities as well as in other states about bringing 
community choice aggregation or green municipal aggregation um, to fruition. Um, and as uh, Priscilla has uh, gone through, just to give a little update on where we're at right now is we're really excited that uh, Providence, uh, Central Falls, Barrington, and South Kingstown all work together to put together an RFP for consultants uh, at the end of last year. And we were lucky enough, Good Energy, to be chosen. Um, I say luck, but I know it was a lot of hard work and uh, engagement with our communities to make sure they knew uh, what it is that they were seeking and, and for us to, us to work on. So we're really excited that Central Falls um, just, I actually think it was two weeks ago today, uh, was the first Rhode Island uh, city government to approve a municipal aggregation plan. And uh, right now we're working with them and their legal staff to prepare to go to the Public Utilities Commission. I know we have a commissioner on board here, so I look forward to sending it her way for the entire commission to look at. Uh, while Providence and uh, Barrington are deep into the development of their plan, really working with local community groups, um, resilience committees, uh, sustainability committees that the towns have set up to develop what the renewable uh, programs are going to look like within it. Um, I know from our perspective, we really like to work within the community to decide what is the program that's going to work best for you uh, and work best for them um, and to make sure that the plan reflects that. So Providence and Barrington have um, have already been reviewing what those renewable options are going to look like. So for us to bring that plan um, to completion. And with South Kingstown, we're actually hoping tonight to give a presentation to their resiliency committee. Um, it's, a, it's a fast moving thing, but we're hoping to get on their docket tonight to begin that discussion uh, there. And if not, we'll probably do it in the next two weeks. So um, each of the towns is moving forward really actively. Um, and then we've been in conversation with a number of other communities over the last six to eight months um, about what it's going to take uh, to bring a plan forward. And we know, once again, with the COVID-19, it's difficult to manage uh, city government. It's hard to get public hearings done. So we're working individually within each community to figure out what's the best way for us to put these plans out to the public, what's the best way to put the plans um, in front of city council members and to have the questions. Um, and so we're really excited that, especially when some of the meeting rules relax and we can get, have, uh, get back to having one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, to really start seeing this move forward quickly. Um, so that's just a little update on where we're at with each community. Priscilla, I wasn't sure if there was anything more that you wanted to make sure I touched on there. Well, I would love for us to highlight um, also briefly the work that Providence has been doing. So last year when we all met at the Botanical um, Center at Roger Williams Park, um, we had Mayor Lorsa speak about the city's climate justice plan. Um, and since then the plan has been released and community choice aggregation is a goal within that plan. So um, Good Energy has, has actually been working with the city of Providence to do some of the um, outreach and engagement. And Jamie, if you can just share what the next step is for Providence. Yeah, actually this Friday morning, um, this as part of the virtual sustainability fair uh, that is launching today that this is all a part of, um, so this Friday morning, we're going to be releasing a survey uh, that includes a number of uh, interactive videos around that, that people can learn more about what community aggregation is all about. Um, and a number of survey questions are going to help us provide that, uh, that individual input that we need to make sure the plan reflects the community values and efforts that are already underway. Um, so that's coming out this Friday. We're doing, we've got a, a working group of advisors throughout the city that are helping us kind of design it and guide what this survey looks like and how we put it to good use. Uh, but it'll be released this Friday morning as part of our virtual sustained PVD. Great, thank you, Jamie. Um, it's really great working with you to advance um, green municipal aggregation. Excellent, thank you, Priscilla. So I want to share with you all um, our local map of sources. Um, some, of course, members um, are very familiar um, with this map. So for, for years, um, as Green Energy Consumers Alliance, we've offered an individual sign-up program called Green Powered, where you can choose to pay a little bit more to support um, local renewable energy. And of course, as the work that we do as a nonprofit, that additional amount that you pay is tax deductible. Um, so that's fantastic. And that has helped us over the years to maintain and support um, local sources that are 100% um, New England based and source um, when looking at small impact hydro or looking at smart, smartly sited solar built on landfill sites. 
and looking at winds and, and so on. So now what we're talking about is doing this at scale with communities um, actually being able to point to where um, their, their local electricity sources are coming from and being able to pass on those environmental um, benefits to, to communities as a whole. So thanks to um, the work that we have been doing in Massachusetts and that we're very proud of, we're seeing how this map um, is expanding and how we're able to support more local projects, thus furthering the advancement of local renewable energy. And that is all on what we call the voluntary market. So this is again getting ahead of state policy and really driving that local demand for more renewable energy. So we're excited um, to be able to continue that work in, in Rhode Island as more communities come on board. Um, and if you are outside of a community um, that's not yet moving forward to implement green municipal aggregation, as Jamie mentioned, that is um, Providence, Barrington, South Kingston, and Central Falls, um, reach out to me. I would love to work with you to figure out how we can help your community in Rhode Island move forward and how we can continue um, bringing on more local sources and really expand the work that we're doing to advance um, local renewable energy. Um, and we know, you know, the end result for us and when we tie it back to our mission of speeding the transition to a low carbon future. It's really, you know, cleaning, how do we clean up our, our power grid um, and add more local renewable energy sources that will result in healthier communities as we really strive to transition uh, off fossil fuels as quickly as possible. So I invite you all to continue being a part of that work. Um, and now I'm really excited to go ahead and introduce Kai Salem, our policy coordinator, which many of you know and um, hopefully advocate with her at the State House for more um, climate progress. Um, so Kai, over to you. Uh, I am glad to be talking to you all today and I wish I could see you in person, uh, but it's great that we can do this as is. So my name is Kai Salem. I am a policy coordinator at Green Energy Consumers Alliance. And I work with Priscilla and Larry and as, uh, many of our panelists on climate legislation and regulation here in Rhode Island. So in Rhode Island, Green Energy Consumers Alliance advocates for policy solutions to climate change that reduce emissions, protect energy consumers, and build equity. We take a pretty practical approach. For example, what can we be doing now that will lead to real emissions reductions in both the short and the long term. This, of course, means incorporating a lot more renewables, as we all know, energy sources like wind and solar, and there's a lot of talk about offshore wind right now, uh, bringing that into the electric grid, and also building out a smart grid with energy storage and other strategies that can maximize what we're getting out of those renewable energy resources. Much more challengingly, it also means decarbonizing our heating and transportation sector. The majority of emissions, especially here in Rhode Island and throughout the Northeast, come from transportation and heating, which run primarily on diesel, gasoline, heating oil, and natural gas. It's really hard to switch those sectors over to solar and wind, but we need to do it to reduce emissions and meet this climate challenge. The solution is electrification through electric vehicles and heat pumps. We are proud to work with all of our panelists on this work in both the legislature and in regulatory proceedings. Before I introduce them, I'll highlight a few of our most important advocacy priorities for Rhode Island. These are also listed in our program, so you can uh, check in and find out how you can get involved in the program that should be in the chat. So our prior policy priorities right now include passing a 100% renewable energy standard. This will get Rhode Island to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. This bill uh, and this policy, it's S2404, sponsored by Senator Josh Miller in the Senate, would implement the governor's executive order from this January, which uh, promised a plan to get us to 100% renewable electricity. We also support implementing the regional proposal for a transportation and climate initiative, which will reduce carbon pollution from transportation, perhaps our most challenging aspect of fighting climate change here in New England, and it would also secure funding for transit and clean transportation options. Finally, our big policy priority is to ensure climate action by passing Act on Climate 2020. This bill is sponsored by Senator Oyer, who will be on our panel, as well as Rep. Plazajewski, 
and it would set Rhode Island's first mandatory carbon emissions reductions target of 50% by 2035, increasing over time. In addition, we support updating Rhode Island's outdated appliance efficiency standards and strengthening the state's energy efficiency programs. Energy efficiency is the backbone of our clean energy work, uh, as I believe Commissioner Uchi will talk about later. We also support bringing back state rebates for electric vehicles. We have the solutions we need to climate change, but they are not being implemented. Rhode Island hasn't had any significant energy or environment legislation in almost three years. And right now, our energy policy seems limited to plans and goals, not programs or strategies that will lead to real emissions reductions. To build momentum on climate action in the General Assembly and elsewhere, we're calling on all Rhode Islanders, you on the phone, uh, to start calling for climate action. This year, we helped lead and start the Climate Crisis Campaign, which is a coalition of individuals, organizations, and businesses, both the expected allies and some unconventional ones, to come together to support climate advocacy. So although the, climate, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has changed how we're thinking about this work, we're not gathering in the General Assembly to call for climate action like we expected to. Instead, we're focusing on building our movements at home. I would still invite you to join us in this work by joining the climate crisis campaign at riclimatecrisis.org or by donating to our advocacy program here at Green Energy Consumers Alliance. As I mentioned, our advocacy has not gone as expected because of the coronavirus pandemic. Meetings of the General Assembly have been suspended and Senator Oyer will talk a little bit more about that, I expect. Um, but we are still doing this work and the climate crisis is showing even more how important it is to have resilient communities and both short and long-term planning to address crises. So today I look forward to hearing more about our priorities and of course the impact of COVID on clean energy in Rhode Island. We have an amazing panel of Rhode Island clean energy leaders to speak on the subject. First up will be State Senator Don Oyer who represents Newport and Jamestown. Dawn was first elected to the Rhode Island Legislature in 2017, although she has been active in Rhode Island political organizing for far longer. Um, notably, she helped shepherd marriage equality through the legislature before she was ever a state senator. And now she is a lead sponsor on Act on Climate 2020, one of our priorities. This bill would keep our government accountable and it is our priority as well as the priority of many other advocacy organizations in Rhode Island right now. Second, we'll hear from Commissioner Marion Gold, who has been at the Public Utilities Commission since 2016. And before her appointment there, Commissioner Gold was the commissioner of the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources. As a leader, Commissioner Gold has worked on the intersection of energy and natural resources for much of her career at University of Rhode Island, at Department of Environmental Management, and at Rhode Island Resource Recovery Corporation. She brings this lens to her role at the Public Utilities Commission, as well as her insightful uh, consideration of how energy and environment and people's Rhode Islanders needs intersect. Third, we'll hear from our current Acting Commissioner of uh, the Office of Energy Resources, Nicholas Ucci. Acting Commissioner Ucci was nominated by Governor Raimondo in January 2020 to serve as the Commissioner of OER but he has been with the Office of Energy Resources for far longer as Deputy Commissioner, and I'm thrilled to still be able to work with him in his new role. During his time at OER, Nick has helped expand the state's clean energy portfolio nearly tenfold, playing a significant role in the selection of the Revolution Wind Project, and he is now leading OER's numerous planning and programmatic efforts, including uh, the heating sector transformation and others. So we look forward to hearing how the Office of Energy Resources will continue these initiatives. Uh, so I think that's everyone and I really look forward to hearing from you all. So uh, Dawn, Senator Oyer, please take it away. Um, well, thank you Kai for the introduction and um, thank you to the Green Energy Consumer Alliance for having me on today to, to talk. I'm looking forward to a great discussion uh, with my fellow panelists and um, I just I appreciate this opportunity. I think um, I think while very rightfully so for the last two months, our attention has been very uh, heavily focused on the public health crisis at hand. 
um, you know, the, the continued need to shift to renewable and green energy and address climate change continues to be a very urgent issue um, that we need to we need to also focus on. And so um, I think, you know, as you mentioned right now, the General Assembly is not actively meeting. We're currently trying to figure out what uh, the rules are going to be as far as, um, you know, how, how we're going to meet, how we're going to be able to come back into session. Um, and what sort of things we're, we're going to be able to address. I think it's going to probably very likely be a very abbreviated General Assembly uh, session when we do return. And so I think that making sure that we're continuing to focus on climate change and, and green energy is definitely top of my mind um, as, as we think about returning to the General Assembly. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Don. Uh, I think Commissioner Gold, uh, you had some opening remarks as well. I do have some over re opening remarks. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. As as Kai said, I'm Marion Gold. I'm a commissioner at the Rhode Island Public Utilities Commissioner, and I'm very sorry that we're not at the Botanical Gardens because that's one of my favorite places, and I haven't been there for a long time. Um, but maybe next year. I'm really pleased to be here today to serve on the panel with commissioner, the commissioner and the senator. And also, I'm so pleased to be joining Green Energy Consumers Alliance. You guys have been working towards a clean energy future for a long time, literally for decades. Another reason why I'm sorry not to be there in person, I always see folks that I haven't seen in many years, and I'm happy to see them still you know, in the good fight. I'm going to bring today to the panel a regulatory perspective on Rhode Island's transition to a clean energy future. And sometimes people think that that's an oxymoron, that regulation and, and uh, transition to clean energy future are opposites, but it's not really true. I'm going to start with some background on what we do at the Public Utility Commission. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the process, uh, bear with me, but I hope the context will be helpful. And then I'm going to talk briefly about a couple of the challenges that we are grappling with as we work towards a no or low carbon energy future. So looking at energy governance at, from a high level, it resembles the three branches of government. So the PUC is like the quasi judicial entity. And then there are two agencies that are part of the executive branch. That's NICS group, the Office of Energy Resources and the Division of Public Utilities and Carriers. They both sit on the governor's cabinet. And then of course, the third branch that's super important is the legislature that plays a key role in setting energy policy in Rhode Island and in other states across the country. So a little bit of background on the PUC is people like to say it's the most important and powerful agency that no one knows anything about. And I can remember being a young person when I just moved to Rhode Island and I got involved in wastewater regulations when I was working at the University of Rhode Island and I was like, whoa, what is this organization? You know, it was so so judicial and very, very technical. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, the PUC is a quasi-judicial entity that regulates electricity and gas distribution utilities. We also regulate water and wastewater, but my focus today will be on energy. So what does it mean when I say we're quasi-judicial? We conduct administrative proceedings that mirror court cases in many ways. We hold hearings in a judicial-like setting with witnesses, lawyers, and cross-examination. And the decisions that we make at the PUC are directly appealable to the Rhode Island Supreme Court. There's three commissioners appointed by the governor with six-year terms that often overlap administrations. The purpose of the PUC is to protect the public interest by regulating utilities to ensure that they provide reliable service at just, just and reasonable rates, that's a term of art in the regulatory world, and in a way that's aligned with public policy goals as defined by state law. In Rhode Island, even though we haven't, as Kai mentioned, passed significant energy legislation, perhaps for a few years, we really have a progressive suite of energy policies in place. And that guides all the work that we do in Rhode Island. Um, state legislation requires that when we make decisions about regulation, we consider social equity, greenhouse gas emissions, and economic development. And this is certainly not the case in other states across the country. So we're ahead of the game already. Given that, um, we, we have a lot of challenges. Um, so what are those challenges? One of the things, it's often said that regulation attempts to provide the checks on a monopoly that competition would 
provide in the marketplace. And I'm gonna talk about two challenges. The first is known as information asymmetry. Utilities have access to much more data about all aspects of the energy system and they have more resources than the public sector and other stakeholders. They have more engineers, they have more lawyers, especially a lot more lawyers, more accountants and other technical experts. And this can make it really challenging for regulators and other policymakers to understand if investments in say infrastructure upgrades proposed by the utility are aligned with the public interest. The challenge with information asymmetry really comes to the fore when we look at utility finances. When they request a rate increase, they submit literally hundreds of pages of documentation to support their request. And they can be very skilled about how to figure out how to maximize their profits. It takes well-trained finance experts to follow the money to see if repair dollars are being used efficiently. And that gets to the whole asymmetry of resources. We don't have a lot of financial experts in the public sector um, in Rhode Island. So the folks that we do have are working really hard. Uh, related to this is the utility can be very willing to take on new initiatives, providing they use ratepayer dollars for the initiative. In other words, providing that their own risk is minimal. So a lot of what we do in the regulatory process is to follow the money. And this can be a very complex process involving economics, accounting, engineering, law, and finance. It entails a deep dive into the details and it can be a slow, litigious, contentious, and cumbersome process, but sometimes that's what it takes to protect the public interest. So a second challenge I wanna mention is that the regulatory system and the tools that we use are in a state of flux that mirror the transition that we're seeing in the energy system as we move to a cleaner energy future. Much like the energy transition, this is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for change. And I have to say, I'm so impressed speaking personally, not for the PUC, about the work that um, Green Consumers is doing with community aggregation, that's really exciting. It's an exciting opportunity that, you know, five years ago was not really on the horizon in Rhode Island. Uh, so, for example, as we transition to a clean energy future, our expectations for the utilities have dramatically changed. We don't just want safe and reliable energy services. Now we need safe, reliable, no carbon, and resilient energy services. Utilities used to be known as stable and boring businesses. Now we're asking them to be innovators while still keeping the lights on, the heat going, and rates low. So the challenge here is how public sector leaders, how folks like Nick and myself and our colleagues at the division and DEM, DOT, can provide meaningful guidance to utilities with respect to what they're expecting from them in terms of performance in these new areas and how we're going to compensate them for that. And, those of you who have been in our hearing room know that's something we've been talking a lot about and it gets really wonky, really weedy. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm looking forward to Nick's remarks. Um, I have to say, Nick, it's, it's kind of a lot more fun to be big picture visionary, but the devil is sometimes in the details. That said, I am really hopeful about the future. By working together, I think we do have a, a chance to shape a sustainable energy future that's gonna benefit our families, our communities, our businesses and the environment. And I'm looking forward to the uh, questions and discussion today. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gold. And that tees up uh, Acting Commissioner Uchi's presentation perfectly. Great, well, thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Nicholas Uchi. I'm the Acting Commissioner of the Office of Energy Resources. And I really appreciate this opportunity to join all of you and GECA for this virtual spring meeting. First, I wanna send my sincerest best wishes to all of you during this unprecedented crisis. I hope you and your families are staying safe and well. I also wanna recognize the leadership of my PUC colleague, Commissioner Gold, and especially Senator Oyer. I know that she has been out in front on many key issues affecting local consumers and our clean energy future, whether it's introducing legislation to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 or urging Congress to enact offshore drilling protections. I, for one, truly value those efforts and we need more voices like hers pushing for bold outcomes. Now, the Office of Energy Resources is Rhode Island's lead state agency on energy policy and programs. We are dedicated to a secure, cost-effective and sustainable energy future. And we work closely with private and public stakeholders to increase the reliability, 
security of our energy supply, reduce energy costs, mitigate price volatility, and improve environmental quality. When it comes to our clean energy and climate change agenda, the global COVID pandemic and resulting economic uncertainty facing Rhode Island citizens and businesses creates challenges, but not insurmountable ones. Now is not the time to pull back from mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and strengthening energy resiliency. Such efforts enhance our economy, not detract from it. The response of our people, communities, and leadership to the COVID crisis has been incredible, and it serves as an important reminder that Rhode Islanders can rise up to meet any challenge, even one as daunting and formidable as climate change. Now, I know my time is limited, so I want to quickly touch upon three major areas that I believe will continue powering Rhode Island's clean energy leadership through the COVID crisis and beyond. Next slide, please. Now, Governor Raimondo has continues, continually challenged the state to accelerate its growth of clean energy resources. For any future in which the state, region, nation, or the globe achieves its climate change goals, the electricity generation system must be nearly fully decarbonized. Next slide, please. On this front, the governor has set two bold but achievable goals for Rhode Island. In March 2017, she announced a strategic goal to increase the state's clean energy portfolio tenfold by the end of 2020 for a total of 1,000 megawatts. Now, at the end of 2019, we had accounted approximately 866 megawatts of clean energy generation, generation capacity in our portfolio. Importantly, these projects, which are co combine both utility scale and local renewables, are already anticipated to meet roughly one third of total energy demand by 2024. Next slide, please. So I, we're on track, I believe, to meet this 1000 megawatt goal by, by the end of the calendar year, but the governor has challenged us to go further. In January, she signed an executive order committing Rhode Island to meet 100% of its electricity demands with renewables by the end of the decade. That executive order directs my office to conduct an economic and energy market analysis and develop actionable policies and programs to reach this bold but achievable goal with recommendations due by the end of the year. This is a nation leading effort and sets a pace faster than any other state toward realizing a fully el renewable electric portfolio. Now, as we look to further accelerate local renewables, we should also consider broader environmental sustainability. That means finding new and innovative ways to incentivize renewable siting at preferred locations, such as disturbed lots or brownfields. We must also strike an appropriate balance between supporting siting at these locations and any incremental development costs that may be incurred and ultimately paid for by local ratepayers. Now we have done some work here. In fact, OER recently announced a commitment for $1 million to encourage solar projects on brownfields on top of a previous million we had already allocated. We are also beginning to examine how other initiatives such as the Renewable Energy Growth Program could support such efforts through creative but affordable incentive structures. Next slide, please. Another area where Rhode Island has excelled is in energy efficiency, which is foundational to our decarbonized future. And GECA has been an incredible partner on this front. It is the least cost means of reducing consumer energy consumption, utility bills, and greenhouse gas emissions. Sustained commitment by stakeholders, national grid, and the state itself has helped Rhode Island remain a national efficiency leader, ranked among the top three states for energy efficiency innovation. Next slide, please. Now, energy efficiency is doing much more than just reducing kilowatt hours. Uh, thanks to our stakeholders like GECA and strong commitments by the utility, our programs have reduced millions of tons of GHG emissions, spurred more than $2 billion in economic benefits, and now support six out of every 10 clean energy jobs in the state. It's a pretty remarkable accomplishment. Next slide, please. And finally, I want to talk briefly about Rhode Island's heating sector transformation initiative. Pursuant to a July 2019 executive order by Governor Raimondo, 
OER, uh, working with our partners at the Division of Public Utilities and Carriers, has issued a comprehensive report intended to advance Rhode Island's develop development of a cleaner, more affordable and reliable heating future. Many of you on this call were quite engaged in our stakeholder discussions to identify economic, energy and environmental opportunities and challenges po posed by our state's heating sector. Next slide, please. Now our, our entire report, all 90 plus pages of it and another 100 or so technical appendices are available on our website. And if you need some good uh, reading this summer, I, I encourage you to download a copy and take a look. But let me draw your attention to a couple of key points. First, we need to be honest about the cost. For many fossil fuel heated customers today, particularly national, natural gas customers who represent the majority of our homes, all of the decarbonized heating solutions we analyzed will likely result in some increase in overall heating costs. There will be significant upfront capital barriers for many consumers as we transition to lower carbon equipment and other heating related investments, particularly for the most vulnerable among us. But we also know and acknowledge that heat and transformation will not take place in isolation. Rather, it is embedded in broader economy wide decarbonization efforts, including a likely shift toward electrified transportation. Heating decarbonization and in particular, the level of electric heat pump penetration that we see in Rhode Island and across the region will affect electricity prices. This could have broader impacts on consumers' energy wallets or the total energy expenditures on baseline electricity consumption and electric vehicle charging in addition to heating. When considering a consumer's overall energy wallet, this figure shows that compared to 2020, any potential increase in heating costs could be at least partially offset by cost decreases elsewhere in the energy wallet, particularly transportation, and by savings through continued energy efficiency investment. This does not mean that individual customers or businesses will not see changes in their heating or energy wallet costs. Policy, energy program design, and incentive and financing structures will all play a key role in mitigating any potential cost increases, particularly where it may affect populations or industries that are highly vulnerable to increasing energy costs. Nonetheless, our work does show that the total energy wallet of tomorrow, representing a largely decarbonized future, is not beyond reach. Next slide, please. So what does this all mean in a world impacted by COVID? And what are the implications as we move to, toward a new normal? To date, before the COVID crisis, Rhode Island has demonstrated that investments in energy efficiency, renewables, and other clean energy solutions grow jobs, spur innovation, and create new investment opportunities. Prior to COVID, we had seen 72% growth in our clean energy workforce since 2014. Clean energy jobs also offer higher wages than the national average, and are widely available to workers without college degrees. According to one recent national report, landing a clean energy job can equal an eight to 19% increase in income. And 45% of all workers in clean energy production, such as electricians, installers, repairers, and power plant operators, have only a high school diploma, while still receiving higher wages than similarly educated peers in other industries. Now, understandably, as COVID's impact ripples through our economy, we will have a lot of work to do to help this sector recover. A national analysis released just last week utilizing federal Department of Labor data found that nearly 600,000 workers in clean energy occupations, representing nearly 18% of the industry's workforce, had filed for unemployment benefits in April and March alone. We have seen some of this temporary job loss here in Rhode Island, particularly for in-person services such as home visits for energy efficiency audits, which have been suspended. On the other hand, Rhode Island did not shut down construction operations as was done in other states. So some clean energy jobs, such as in solar development, have been impacted to a lesser degree. My team has been in touch with both our energy efficiency and renewable industry partners to better understand COVID's impact on clean energy jobs and formulate strategies to help ramp back up as we move forward under a new normal. 
One opportunity that National Grid has been exploring is virtual home energy audits. There, consumers can participate in a live virtual discussion with an energy specialist to learn more about their home and find opportunities to save money in energy. No cost energy saving products such as LEDs, advanced power strips and low flow shower heads are being shipped directly to the door for the homeowner to install. And to help consumers during these difficult times, participants can receive 100% off approved insulation up to $15,000, no cost air sealing and additional rebates toward qualifying home energy efficient heating, cooling and water heating equipment. Now, I remain optimistic that as restrictions gradually loosen, work will ramp back up in the sector. However, we will need to continue examining how incentive and financing designs can be modified across the clean energy universe to support customers looking to make investments, but facing more challenging circumstances due to lost wages and other COVID-related impacts. Further, in further increasing utility bills is likely not an answer, so we will need to be creative. Federal stimulus funds would certainly help, but until more details come out of Washington, we will need to work within our existing constructs. Next slide. And with that, uh, I appreciate your time and attention and look forward to our question and answers. Thank you. Thanks so much, Commissioner. Uh, it's great to hear from everyone. Uh, I have a few questions to ask all of you as the panel, um, some individual, some group, but please feel free to weigh in if you feel so inspired. And to our audience, uh, please ask questions. We'll have time for question and answers, plenty of time after um, the first couple of questions on the panel. Uh, in the, the sidebar um, that you have on your screen, there should be a place that says chat where you can write in any questions and the Green Energy Consumers Alliance staff will read them, uh, send them on to me, and we'll try to get them answered by the panel. So please think of questions over the course of this and send them in. Uh, so first, I'd like to ask, ask you know, where, um, what, so we haven't seen a lot of movement on energy and environment policy priorities over the last couple of years, as I mentioned, and as you know, can you talk a little bit about the General Assembly's appetite for uh passing energy climate legislation what kind of political environment do you see in the legislature in both the house and the senate as it would relate to those issues sure so i think um you know i want to start off by recognizing you know the amount of the amount of work historically that has been done in rhode island i do think that that's important to you know start with the successes i think um you know i actually moved out here because of the work and the leadership that rhode island had in offshore wind projects with the Black Island Wind Farm being one of, you know, being the first um, first offshore wind uh, facility in the United States. And I think that that is, you know, that's, that's a very, um, you know, that's very important for the context of this conversation. I think also, mm -hmm. you know, as you were talking about the municipal aggregation, energy efficiency. So I think all of those programs and putting forward those, those policies and those programs, I think, you know, those were all big lifts as as those work their way through the general assembly before my time there um and i think i think now you know while certainly none of those efforts were low-hanging fruit per se i think part of the thinking and the conversation now is you know trying to work through some very complex um complex situations and how do we how can we be bold and how can we take action that needs to be taken in a very urgent um urgent circumstance when i talk to a lot of people not just my general assembly colleagues but you know the the concerns around climate action seem so huge and and so it becomes almost a where do we start and how do you how do you tackle a problem that is so so large and it's you know how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time um and so i think that that's the approach we need to be taking we need to learn from our successes i've been very excited to see the work that has been coming out from oer with regard to what report you know the reports the heating sector transformation work that they've been doing um and i think very rightly so we need to continue to to do more and and we need to be bold and we need to make sure that we're um that we are facing the 
facing the challenge, the size of the challenge that we're facing needs to be met with bold action. And so, you know, that's why I introduced the Act on Climate bill because, you know, learning what we've learned from when the legislation was originally introduced in 2014 and how we can build upon that framework to kind of take the next step. Um, I think, you know, another thing I'll say is that I think from the perspective of a General Assembly member, the the influence of industry is very strong and very present. After I got elected in 2017, one of the first emails I got uh, to my official Senate email address was from an industry group, um, an oil and gas group. They added me to their listserv and immediately started sending me propaganda pieces. Um, so I think that there's, you know, this false narrative that, you know, the cost of this is that there's going to be some sort of competition between regional competitiveness, economic concerns, and these kind of environmental and energy goals. I don't see them as conflicting issues. I, I think as Commissioner, um, Commissioner, Acting Commissioner Uchi said earlier that, you know, the aspects of this developing policies in this area can really be complementary. We should be continuing to lead in green energy and efficiency because these are jobs. You know, this is this is an opportunity to really shift our economics and shift our our job um, our job focus points and make sure that we're addressing the crisis that's facing us. And I think it can be beneficial. You know, being a small state. Um, we have the opportunity to try things that maybe other states, um, it would be unwieldy with the size of other states. So I think we need to continue to, to, um, to educate and to advocate to make sure that we're moving forward on, on these issues. Thank you, Senator. Um, that's a great overview. And as I mentioned in my earlier comments, green energy consumers is also uh, prioritizing the Act on Climate Bill, which to remind everyone uh, sets mandatory targets. Rhode Island does have targets currently, but they're actually non-mandatory around carbon emissions reduction. Uh, and we're excited about uh, the target that would be 50% reduction by 2035. It's so important to have short-term goals um, when we're thinking about clean energy because we can't just keep putting off climate action until 2030, 2040. Uh, and in that vein, Commissioner Uchi, I'd like to ask, the governor has a number of goals. Um, you mentioned a few of them. Do you have any uh, more detailed updates on the sense of how all of these studies and planning processes are going? Are we going to be able to have a plan that gets us to 100% renewable electricity by 2030? Um, and any sense of what's coming once these plans are completed? Sure, thanks for the question. Uh, so let's take the renewables first. <clears throat> From a utility scale perspective, in less than a year, we've added 450 megawatts of renewables to our portfolio. The Revolution Wind Offshore Wind Project alone is expected to deliver $91 million in energy cost savings, 11 million metric tons in reduced emissions, and provide enough carbon-free energy to power a quarter of Rhode Island's electric use, about 270-ish thousand homes while generating at least 800 construction jobs, 50 permanent jobs, and uh, more positive externalities through the supply chain. And just a couple of months ago, we also received approval for a 50 megawatt solar project that's located actually in Connecticut at a gravel pit, which is good, good sighting, uh, to save, and that project is expected to save consumers $30 million over 20 years. It's also the first time in the state's history which all three, all three of Rhode Island's electric utilities, National Grid, Pascog, and Block Island, have agreed to share in a project output and contract. So we're moving, and we're moving quick. Um, locally, we continue to see new projects being developed through the Renewable Energy Growth Program and through net metering. As you mentioned, we, we do have a lot of studies underway. That's because this work is complicated, it's, and it's all intricately linked. The heating system, the transportation system, and uh, the electric system. It's not its not just installing air source heat pumps in, in a person's home or in a neighborhood. It's thinking at scale, what do these investments do to our distribution system, electric or gas, to the trans interstate transmission system? What does it mean for the workforce that would be needed to do this and do it well? 
uh, what sort of investments uh, in terms of public or private capital would be needed, and how do we ensure that low and moderate income con consumers and small businesses can take part in this clean energy revolution. So, uh, you know, as, as I discussed in my slides, we, we, we spent many months working with uh, stakeholders very openly in a, in a number of uh, public workshops that we held, thinking through some of those opportunities and challenges in the heating sector. And we're gonna do the same exact thing this summer uh, in advancing the governor's work uh, for 100% renewables by 2030. I'm happy to announce on, on this uh, at this event that uh, OER has uh, locked down the Brattle Group to support us in the work on 100% renewables. It's the same te project team actually that worked with us on the heating sector transformation effort. And there are of course a lot of synergies there as we think about future load growth associated with heating and transportation decarbonization, we, we, we will need to think through the implications on the on the electric system and plan for it. Uh, and so we will uh, hold uh, a series of public workshops this summer related to that work, very, very much like we did with heating. Uh, take stakeholder feedback and input and insight and, uh, you know, work that into our analysis. One of the things you mentioned earlier, Kai, about 100% renewable energy standard is something that is uh, important to me and that I believe may be uh, you know, one of the tools we will need to utilize in order to achieve the governor's goal. And so that in particular will be, uh, I think, a significant piece of our analysis moving forward. We not only, not only wanna look at the costs and benefits associated with this rapid acceleration of renewables, ensuring that we take advantage of local growth in small scale solar, but also looking at some more commercial scale, utility scale opportunities where we can leverage uh, economies and industry, uh, such as offshore wind, uh, and 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 think about the sorts of policies like a renewable energy standard that can that can ensure uh, ensure that we hit the mark, and that it hits the mark in a way that makes sense for Rhode Island and Rhode Islanders, uh, in terms of the costs and benefits associated with all our other. Uh, programs that uh, are in this space. So I think that the, the work we've done, the analytical work we've done is critical. It's, it's foundational to being able to bring together citizens, businesses, and policymakers like the Senator to give them confidence that uh, their decisions that they make in the state house are ultimately for the best uh, for our economy and, and for our citizens. <laughs> That's great. And as you mentioned, the renewable energy standard is indeed one of our priorities and uh, a policy we've worked on for a long time. And I think it's been really successful in um, dropping that and efficiency have led to major gains on electric sector emissions over the past decade or two. Uh, Commissioner Gold, I think you covered a little bit of this um, in your introductory remarks, but I'd love for you to go more in detail. The Public Utilities Commission is a pretty opaque regulatory body. Do you have, what do you wish that the regular Rhode Islander knew about the PUC? And are there ways for the regular Rhode Islander to um, follow proceedings or influence those decisions? Yes, <laughs> we are. Yeah, so what I would like people to know, and this is something that I did not fully appreciate, is that the for anyone, for advocates and for anyone working in the energy industry, the regulatory arena can be a very powerful tool to move policy into practice. And this has to do with the power of regulations to help us understand the complex workings of the energy system that, that Commissioner Uchi alluded to. So there's a it, it is a complex web. There's um, we have a very, as we've talked about, a very progressive suite of legislation that provides a framework for the regulatory decisions, least cost procurement, revenue decoupling. We have our renewable energy growth program. We have the Resilient Rhode Island Act. And we also have an incredibly progressive utility, um, National Grid, who is interested in working with us towards a clean energy future. But the devil is in the details. And as I said earlier, utilities are very good at finding ways to avoid risk. 
We like the risk avoidance characteristic when it comes to keeping the lights on, but that characteristic can also be challenging when we're trying to figure out how to deal with the, you know, all the things that, that you talked about, Commissioner Uchi. We need to electrify our transportation. We need to clean up the heating sector. And then we have probably 30% of our families in Rhode Island before COVID were struggling to pay their energy bills. So it's really important that we move forward as, you know, as, as um, carefully as we can and using our, our, our relatively scarce resources. And a lot of this comes down to how are we going to find a way to make it feasible for people? I, and I agree, I think, I think more and more, especially living in a coastal state, people are aware of the, you know, the real problems that climate change poses. But, but when they're faced with, you know, do I put food on the table for my family or do I you know, pay a little bit more on my energy bill, usually the short term needs um, win out. So we have to be really, really careful and the regulatory arena can allow us to ask the hard questions to make sure we're making the best use of scarce resources. So I think that's what I would say. I was just, I happened to be listening to someone who, a young woman who's just written a book about the energy transition. And she was talking about um, California where they actually have a fund, a public fund that provides resources for small advocacy groups or advocacy groups um, to intervene in the regulatory arena because it is, it is very powerful, but it's expensive. And utility can bring in, Commissioner Uchi, you know this, they can bring, in fact, they just hired your lawyer. They can bring five lawyers to a hearing and 10 accountants. And we have, you know, Nick and his incredibly wonderful team of hardworking people, but we're all stretched thin. And, and that is what we are you know, trying to be very careful about. Um, on the other hand, especially in Rhode Island, we're not, we, we, we are, it's amazing that we do as well as we do on our energy programs because we don't have the resources that some of our sister states have. New York, California, Massachusetts, all have more dollars to put into clean energy than, than we have. So that's, I just lost my screen. So that's a challenge. Uh, so I guess my message is, I also think that we need to do better um, getting out into the community and engaging on these issues earlier and helping um, advocates understand how they can work in the regulatory arena. Now, there we are. I lost you for a while, but I'm back. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's helpful, but um, yeah, those I are think it's something. Great points. And I certainly know the challenge of going through um, hundreds of pages of obtuse regulatory documents. It's hard for a small advocacy organization, um, but we try to do it to bridge the gap between where you all are and where our members are and where Rhode Islanders are. Uh, so one question I have for all of you is what are the, what is the biggest or some of the big challenges, maybe just the biggest because we're running short on time, uh, challenge you see in front of Rhode Island right now as we move towards transitioning to a clean energy future? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to just start and, and to bring it home. Um, you know, COVID's impact on our economy will likely be with us for, for a long time. Uh, at a minimum, it'll have impacts on uh, the, the ability of consumers and businesses and public entities too, to invest in comprehensive clean energy uh, in measures, particularly uh, those at the retail level uh, that require upfront capital for local consumers. Now, as I mentioned in my remarks, I think that will necessitate more cr creativity and how we design and deliver incentive and financing programs to enable energy efficiency, renewable, and, and other clean transit investments. Uh, and I don't think that we can necessarily count on additional public dollars to do that. Uh, you know, again, we, we wait to see what may come out of Washington and, and future stimulus uh, uh, bills. Uh, but we know that, you know, this has had a real impact on our state economy too. And, and you know, we are, we're all gonna need to do some heavy lifting here uh, to get us back on track. But I want folks to know that there are things that we, we can and are doing to leverage this moment. So out of great challenge comes some interesting opportunities. Let me give you one example. With many clean energy workers struggling, now is the time that we should be supporting vendor and worker training and certification 
to ensure the industry is fully prepared and behind our clean energy system once we get back to, to, to a new normal. As one example, we want to make sure that HVAC contractors, the vendors and workers are properly trained to install high efficiency air source heat pumps to maximize the energy, economic and environmental benefits from those investments for the home or business owner for society at large. And as we discussed earlier, we're also using this, this time to put in the hard work to do the difficult analysis to understand the costs, benefits, and longer-term implications of these significant system transformations, like in heating and in the electric sector. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I, you know, I, I think, yes, COVID is going to impact the way we move forward with certain initiatives, but I think that through creativity, and importantly in Rhode Island, and this gets back to Commissioner Gold's point, we may not have the resources or, or the, the, the labor uh, as in New York or, or uh, Massachusetts, but we have collaboration in Rhode Island. That's where we excel in, in, in a dozen years of working on energy uh, for the state. No other state collaborates as we do. That is where we excel, that is our strength. And, we, and that ensures that we ultimately, in, uh, uh, that we ultimately arrive at solutions that work for everybody. Uh, and we need to continue to doing that more now than ever. And I know that GECA has, has been a wonderful partner in a lot of those conversations. Um, but as Marion said, you know, the utility, we have a very progressive utility here. And certainly, uh, Senator Oyer and her colleagues, you know, we're going to continue to lean on them too to provide the policy support needed, uh, you know, to push our agenda forward. So I think one of the, um, one of the biggest challenges is um, that so the existing system and, and the reliance on fossil fuels is so baked into our system, into our economy, into every aspect of our system, so much so that the costs of that system, there's so many really, quite frankly, externalities, the negative health impacts that we have from um, poor air quality, from fossil fuel emissions, you know, that's just that right now is just kind of an accepted part of doing business every day. Um, you know, the the thinking about, you know, what are, let's let's uh, repair our roads and our bridges, which means more roads and bridges, which doubles down on more vehicular emissions. You know, that is a baked in way of thinking. And so I think one of our biggest challenges is trying to take what I think everybody on this call knows is that there is a better and brighter future and an alternative future that we can achieve. But we, um, what, as so, so long as we're facing those kind of, um, it, it, you know, those kind of upfront costs or the expectation of the upfront cost because of the baked in costs that we all currently live with. Um, and I think, you know, we need to start changing the thinking, making sure that we're integrating the, the, this, these concepts into every agency throughout the state um, and making sure that when we're thinking about these costs and the upfront costs, we also need to remember that there's a cost of inaction. And I think as, you know, as the ocean state, I represent Newport and Jamestown. We're extremely vulnerable to all of the impacts of climate change. So on one hand, I'm having these conversations with the municipalities about how do you address the real infrastructure challenges and the cost of the infrastructure adaptations that we're going to have to make as the seas continue to rise? How do we continue to address asthma rates as they are impacting certain, certain communities that are more vulnerable and on the front line of some of these facilities? So we really need to start um, comprehensively thinking about the costs of the system that exists now and help everyone shift their thinking about how do we integrate this future and how do we share our vision for a different and a brighter future. So I'll just chime in. I am so glad you're thinking that way and I'm really looking forward to going out and having a cup of coffee with you at some point. Um, I think I so I echo everything you're saying. I think it's incredibly challenging, but also perhaps exciting. And and Commissioner Uchi, I, I think that you're going to be putting some um, regional greenhouse gas initiative funds into the heat pump world. I think there may be an opportunity um, to to continue to do some research during this period where consumer demand may not be 
as high as it might be otherwise because of the economic situation to do some research into how we can best integrate an electrified uh, heating system into the overall energy system. And the Brattle Report does a really good job talking about opportunities and challenges and uncertainties as we try to transition to a future where not only, you know, are we not going to be using, um, you know, oil and coal, but we're not going to be using natural gas. So we're doing some good research. The utility is with repair funding and, and good oversight on how to integrate electric vehicles into the system. So how can we prepare now to make sure that we, you know, lower overall demand, heat demand so that we don't have to spend millions of dollars upgrading our electricity system. We can do the same thing on the heating side. And I say that as someone, and I think Commissioner Uchi, you share this, I have just transitioned from um, oil heat to heat pumps. So I have an old house, I have four different units. I have individual thermostats that don't talk to each other because the wiring in my house is old. So I think that that is a challenge. How can I make sure that I'm using my new efficient heat pumps um, more, most efficiently? And what does that look like as we're thinking about the um, electric grid of the future? And I, I just want to say that in the last crisis, we had a lot of era dollars that went towards research nationally and also um, with local utilities. And the fruits of that research are now making their way into electric grid understanding. And, and National Grid actually has hired some great scientists who you work used to work at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And they're like out on cutting edge trying to understand how to upgrade the electricity grid. I'm looking forward to having that same kind of research um, done on the natural gas side of the house. And here, another opportunity we have is we have National Grid which owns both the electricity and the gas distribution you know, service. They also are headquartered in England, which has national decarbonization goals. So National Grid is used to thinking about what a decarbonized future might look like. So I think those are advantages for us to act on. Great, and most of you answered uh, two questions, which is awesome, both what are the challenges and what are some of Rhode Island's advantages? Uh, we have a bunch of audience questions. We're not going to have time to get through most of them, unfortunately, but I'll ask just a few. Um, so we had a number of questions around heating sector transformation in our heating system. We all know the challenges that uh, that, that sector has for us. And Senator Oyer, you also experienced um, the outages in Aquinnick Island that is now over a year old, which represents some of the reliability challenges as well. Uh, so two questions would be, um, first, how does the uh, fact that we have, and Mr. Gold, you just got at this a little bit, how does the fact that we have one utility for both electric and gas uh, help or hinder us in regards to our heating sector transformation? And in addition, uh, the paradigm set up by the heating sector transformation report seemed to fail to consider the true costs of fossil fuels, as uh, Senator Oyer discussed. We recently saw a similar Brattle report for the 80 by 50 work in Massachusetts on emissions reductions. And that Brattle report um, assumed, unlike our Brattle report on heating sector transformation, that electrification is the path forward for uh, heating sector. So how do we think about those baked in fossil fuel externalities when it comes to the work that's being done in our heating sector? And how do we think about National Grid as a gas utility? I will. I'll just start by saying, Commissioner Gold, if you feel ready. Well, I don't. I don't really feel ready, but I do uh, say when I first got to the PUC, I remember uh, the chairperson uh, Meg Curran saying that one of the challenges we face is that we get. Um, issues presented to us in a very siloed fashion. So the utility will come in with a $140 million energy efficiency budget. And then the, you know, the next week they'll come in with a $150 million um, budget to upgrade the gas infrastructure system. And in the, uh, in the beginning, when I first got there, I would you know, I'd ask the, some big picture questions to the engineers of the lawyers who are testifying and they would look at me very blankly because they were focused on making sure that, you know, whatever they were doing, they were doing as well as possible, but they weren't thinking big picture. And that is something that is starting to change. So in the last um, gas 
We have something called the Gas Infrastructure Safety and Reliability Budget, where we invest a lot of money appropriately to plug leaks in the gas pipeline so that we don't have a lot of methane escaping into the atmosphere. There's also, and, the, and they, for the first time, proposed investigating alternatives to extending gas services to parts of Rhode Island that didn't have gas and instead they wanted they proposed doing some research into renewable natural gas that was taken out of the proposal before it came before the commission i think it was removed in negotiations with the division but it was interesting to see utilities starting to think that way um, so they're working on it um, there are some advocates who are looking to a, a zero carbon future who think that the gas you know as brattleport reported it may be that there's um, a function that we can, a service that we can get from the infrastructure, the investment we already have baked into the gas pipeline distribution. Maybe there's a way that we can use those investments. I'm not sure that we know the answer to that. Um, I think the advantage we have is that, again, National Grid is grappling with these issues in the UK as well as in Massachusetts and New York, you know, the two other areas where they work. And all three states, Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island, share very aggressive clean energy goals. So. There's a lot of pressure on the utility to put their best minds to work on this problem. I don't think we have the answers, but I think the Brattle report contains a lot of valuable information we can use to try to understand the dynamics. I'll stop there. Yeah, let me chime in. Um, first, I will say that we, you know, if you go through the report and you look through the technical appendices, I, I would say that we we did account for uh, the cost of carbon uh, in our analytical work, but. Let me just give one example as to why it's not it's not as easy to it's not so easy to say well we should just electrify everything and be done with it and, and here's why one we still don't know the full cost of wide-scale implementation of these technologies and the report goes through that in detail but also think of it at the consumer level so i have a 1964 home here in coventry with a 1964 vintage oil burner plus i have religion and so for me, a climate religion, right? Despite the- I was gonna so, say. So for me to move to, a, to, to an air source heat pump as I have done in my home, it made sense. And it was, an, it was a good investment decision with the incentives and financing available. And at the point of where my equipment was ready to fail, that I moved ahead and made that decision. But my next door neighbor who just had his oil burner replaced maybe five years ago, He's not at the same point in, in his find, in his decision as I am. His his new furnace is expected to last him 30 to 50 years. And so it's it every we really spent a lot of time going through this in the report to look at the taxonomy of our heating system in Rhode Island, in which we have, yes, yeah, 60% of folks on natural gas, but we have another 35, almost 40% of folks who are on oil and propane, and they have different needs. Moreover, on the natural gas front, it's not just it's not just as easy as just trimming off sections of the pipe. Um, ultimately, the the system that we have in place, right? We have a we have we have a lot of challenges with. We've got methane leaks that we're working on through pipe replacement, et cetera. We have issues that have that have happened out uh, on Aquidneck Island, as the senator knows all too well. Uh, similarly, on the electric side, by the way, when you do electrify everything, now you're completely relying upon your transmission and distribution system. Mm -hmm. And we know what it's like in a nor'easter when we lose power and people can't play, well, at least my kids can't play their PlayStation <laughs> for a couple of hours. It's chaos. So imagine if all your heating and your, you know, and your your cooking are all tied to that as well. But th these are really complex matters that I think the report tries to point out where our decision points may be and, and our conclusion one that i have endorsed is that it's much too soon to to go ahead and say pick pick one winner i do believe electrification in the end will ultimately be a, a you know i think will ultimately serve a majority of customers yeah I think so. 20 to 50 20 to 30 years from now but we need to spend the next decade first trying to decarbonize all of our fuel types including electricity, but also increasing our bio blend and oil and propane and on the natural gas side. So that whatever pathway we choose, whatever one works for you as an individual customer, you're gonna be carbon free. That, that's critical. Um, and the other is, uh, as Commissioner Gold mentioned, continuing to work with the utility to examining uh, to examine opportunities for pilot and, short, and, and investments 
so that we can demonstrate these various technologies and determine then what's a winner and what's a loser. So thanks. Um, I think I just wanted, one of the things I wanted to add to, to what, um, what was already said is that, you know, thinking about this issue really came to the forefront for me, as, as you mentioned, the Aquidneck Island um, gas outage last, last year, um, which, you know, our, our poor small businesses, I mean, winter's already a tough time for them. They get that gas outage and now they have COVID, so the COVID situation. So, um, you know, but in thinking about this, these infrastructure conversations, I think, you know, one of the benefits for me in having the position in the General Assembly is that I get to think about this from the big picture. And, you know, as we were talking about the transition to gas, um, you know, that was always argued to be a bridge fuel. Um, and I think for me, where I'm sitting and thinking about where our mix of fuel sources are in Rhode Island, I feel like we're pretty comfortably on the bridge. Um, and again, Rhode Island is a different, uh, you know, we're smaller, we're in a different position than some other states. I think some other states haven't made as much, uh, you know, as much advancement as we have made in this energy conversation. So I think for us, Rhode Island is on the bridge. If, if you're going to assume that gas is the bridge fuel, we're on the bridge. How do we get off the bridge? How do we get to the other side? What does that look like? Um, and I think we need to be really cognizant about what those costs are that we're building into the existing system and making sure that we're not making investments now that are going to unnecessarily extend the amount of time we spend on this bridge. We need to make sure that are the costs that we're going to spend on these pipelines, is this the right way for us to be spending the money or do we need to make sure that, do we need to put more of that money into energy efficiency programs? You know, and so I think that those are a lot of questions and I think you know, a lot of it is going to come down to cost and those big picture conversations. Um, and you know, if there, I'm always happy to introduce additional um, additional legislation and additional um, additional uh, priorities in the budget to make sure that we're pushing forward so we get to that the other side of that bridge sooner rather than later. Great answer, uh, and thank you everyone for your really thoughtful answer to that question. Uh, we are approaching the end of our time. Uh, we had so many good questions and hopefully we'll be able to uh, connect all of our question askers uh, with the panelists later to get some of those answered. For now, um, I will pass the microphone back to our executive director, Larry Cretion. But most importantly, thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. And I look forward to working with you to implement a lot of what we've talked about. And I hope that our audience can join us in that as well. So uh, Larry, come back. Hopefully you can pop up on screen and close this up for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Senator, and also the commissioners uh, for really uh, helping us out to uh, give a sense to the, to the people who viewed this what's going on in Rhode Island energy policy right now. And, you know, we're pretty optimistic at Green Energy Consumers. You're gonna hear a lot more from Kai and from others here at the organization on a range of issues. Um, we're gonna be all over trying to increase the renewable energy standard. We're gonna be all for trying to make the uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets mandatory moving forward on uh, electric vehicles and heat pumps. Uh, we're very excited about this. and. And for those of you who had questions that we didn't get a chance to have answered today, you can still uh, communicate to Kai at greenenergyconsumers.org, and we'll try to make sure that there are some answers to those things. Um, this is our spring meeting coming to a wrap, and we hope that you enjoyed it. Over 100 people did uh, attend. Um, just a reminder, um, we know that for some of you who are on this call, um, this is a difficult economic time as well as concern about public health. But if you are in a position financially to support our organization, uh, please do. We're doing okay as an organization financially, but we will take some sort of a hit as a result of the virus. And if you can make a donation to us, we'd greatly appreciate it. You can go to greenenergyconsumers.org uh, backslash donate. Um, and so that's it on behalf of the staff and board. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>